So uh, I was talking to some other people in the photo department. This might be the last semester that we do this online. I, I think you all have been a great group for it. Um, it sometimes it's kind of hard to translate in you know this over the computer, but you all so far have been really doing a great job. Um, but I think this might be the last semester that we do it online like this until you know unless you know something happens. Hopefully that doesn't. But um, but anyway, so today what we're going to be talking about is shutter speed, and um, I feel like everybody here pretty much has a pretty firm grasp of it, like what it means and what it does and you know how it works. There are some intricacies to shutter speed though that we're gonna talk about a little bit today and why some shutter speeds might be better for certain things and other shutter speeds um, for other things. So we're gonna go over that. Um, and, uh, but first I wanted to look at a couple of, just a couple, just quick, not really even a critique, but just kind of a quick, look over some students' work that's been done in this class so far. Um, and generally, uh, I don't have like official critiques, but I think these are nice just to get an idea of what our fellow students are doing. So we're gonna do that. I'm gonna show you, Ann, are you okay with me showing your work? You okay with that? Yes, yeah, sorry, I was plugging in my computer. <laughs> yeah, I just wanna make sure. So, Let's see, did that work? I don't know if it did. It didn't go to that screen. Share screen, go to that. There we go. Do you all see Flickr there? Does it say, it says my screen sharing's paused. Maybe if I go over here. There, okay, because it's on a different monitor. That's why. Okay, so let's go here and uh, go to albums. And we'll just have a look at these. I really just right away, I really was drawn to this, but these are really nice color color images here. Um, so without all the technicalities, just the simplicity of the, this is good. You know, it's not the most knock your, you know, knock you out of the park, exciting subject matter, but in a way that's what I look for a lot of times is trying to find something creative out of the mundane and it can be simple things like this like this piece of plastic that's probably a child's playhouse or something and something that's screwed to it it's it's just a field of red with a blue shape and and he, this kind of throws me off a little bit up in the upper right hand corner if i'm being super nitpicky about composition because i like this red field but the idea of this just as itself is 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 nice that you have the the ability to think outside the box and not just go everything has to be objective everything has to be something people recognize and i think that's a strong quality to have as a photographer so that's good and then technically i like that you're staying at five six here um just letting in as much light as you can right now and that's going to change this week but right now keeping that at five six you're letting in as much light possible with your aperture there and um your ISO is low, which it should be because you're outside and you've got decent light and your, your, your shutter speed fit right in with that. So that's good. The only time on ISO that you really want to start questioning it is if you find yourself at really long shutter speeds and you don't want to be, and especially if you're hand holding. Um, if you have a tripod, it's not as big of a deal but it still can be. And that's that's a lot what we're going to lead into today. But this works out pretty perfectly here. 200 ISO, 125th, perfectly manageable shutter speed. So that's good. Um, and then this one I really enjoy just from this perspective. This is a nice, this is like a child's perspective in a way. It's just kind of like, it reminds me of, you know, I had a, when my son was a kid, we had a little playhouse for him in his backyard. And it just, I love the color and just the atmosphere of this. And, and it's just, and I also like the exposure. The exposure is very good for the blue sky. It's a nice, even exposure because you're, you're getting this bright area exposed pretty well. And you're also getting this darker interior exposed well enough too. Now it's a little bit more underexposed, but it's not bad. And her flash didn't fire, which is good because you could have technically used a flash in here and lit this up, but I don't think that's necessary. I think this looks good the way it is. Um, personally and again just a good a good um 
a good combination of settings on the camera. And that's something I look for. And then the other thing, just to let you know, when I'm grading, I don't really dig into this, but I'll just check and make sure like, you know, I look at, see if your white balance is good, you know, white balance manual, which that can be problematic unless you, if you know what you're doing, you can set your white balance to manual. Like this would be white balance for shade or, uh, you know, cloudy day, but generally white balance auto is okay. Um, especially in the professional realm. Some I've, I've shoot with a guy and he would always do it in degrees Kelvin and do it manual. And you can, you can set your own white balance, whatever light temperature you want, but auto generally on modern cameras is pretty good. Um, so I'm not against using auto white balance if you want to do that, but if you're good with the manual white balance, that's okay too. This, this one is really nice as well. I love this is kind of like shadow play before shadow play, but I just love the little the detail in the brick and how it, it you know, just even this little splashes of light here. It's well composed, um, nice vertical image and vertical images can be challenging compositionally. And I think this is really well composed. And again, um, good color as well. I like this kind of sea, I don't know, it's kind of a blue, ocean blue look just got a nice nice vibe to it relaxing vibe um so that's good and again good good settings on the on the camera there and then again here you almost again just it, it, it these almost feel kind of meditative to me a little bit and just relaxing and 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 enjoyable to look at um even with these lines coming across here which look like there were shadows of maybe power lines or something like that but it, it's not bothersome they kind of weave themselves in with the with the with the shape so again i think it's a good composition nice bright color good exposure good detail um and then this one is probably in my like compositionally is is really strong here um and 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 again this is some sort of abstract form here I mean, obviously, we all we can tell that's some pole in a parking lot, and that's a parking line. But the way that these lines cut across that line in these angles here, in this bottom left-hand weight of this, it's just really, when you look at this, for me personally, I know that the photographer was paying a lot of attention to how she framed it. It's it's quite obvious. And that's something I look at when I look at photos. Does this photo look haphazard? Or does this photo look thought out? And this definitely looks thought out the way it's composed and put together. Um, good. And again, really good exposure. Manual manual skills here are perfect, really. And, and that 5.6 is helpful, even if, because you don't need depth of field for stuff like this. I mean, in my opinion, again, that's maybe just my opinion. But for this, I like that the asphalt is soft in this. Like it's not, I don't need to see every little, rock in the asphalt uh, the focus is here and then this just softens up but it's not so much that it's totally blurred that you can't tell what's going on so i think five six works even maybe eight would have worked there but five six is pretty good for that um because you know really the focus is here but it's also it's just it's almost like an abstract painting or you know an abstract drawing of some kind so works really well and then here we have just um now this maybe falls a little bit into shadow a little bit, but it's not as bright as you maybe wanted it to be. But again, it the exposure feels like it's more for this purple light here, which is sometimes those are choices you make as a photographer. Um, again, the exposure is good. You, you brought the ISO down even a little farther than you had before, it looks like, because you had it at 200. Yeah, so you brought the ISO down even, even lower which is giving you more detail, which I'm, it's probably hard to tell the difference between 100 and 200, but, um, and that, I don't, I'm not saying that darkened it up, but you have a little bit of a faster shutter speed too. Um, but still good composition here, good angular lines, good artistic eye on this. I feel, you know, it's, just, it's a balanced photo. It feels right when you look at it. Some of those things, I don't know if that's something you can teach, but you know, you, you tell people rule of thirds and, angular lines leading lines and all those things but then it just becomes a feel it just kind of becomes you know when you look at it does it does it feel like it sits right and i definitely think that does and i feel like this does as well and here we here we went down to a 30th so big jump in light there from this from this image to this image that that is a 320th shutter speed 
And then we go to a 30th of a second here, which is a huge jump in exposure, a lot more light being let in the camera here. And, and this one's brighter, but I think it was also, this one might have been in a darker situation, but it, it ironically enough, it looks brighter than the, the one before it because of probably the, the slower shutter speed, obviously. But uh, this one feels nice and bright and open and airy. So in very good color again, this is what I'm looking for in emphasized color. These kind of just studies in, in bright colors and very good composition here as well. Left third, leading line, um, simple. Uh, you know, I've said that maybe more to the first class. I don't know as much of you, but the, the less is more, in my opinion. Again, you take that for what it is, but I've always been one to gravitate towards like the Bauhaus movement as far as minimalism, the less you have and you can still express an idea, the the better that that better that is in some way, it just the simpler way of conveying an idea. And he, you feel that here. Um, not that it's conveying an idea, but the composition is simple. It's not cluttered. It's not full of a lot of things to look at. Um, so uh, and then and then here is just a and is this just like a reflection from a prism or something on a wall? No, it's just the my shower door reflecting through the window uh -huh. on the right. wall. Okay, yeah. So your shower door is glass. It just kind of refracted the uh, RG RGB there a little bit. Roy G. Biv there, I guess that is right. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and again, it's just a nice, simple. Um, again. Uh, not to go too deep into this, but a lot of people, if they saw this or just a wall, they'd say, oh, it's just a gray wall with some, you know, rainbow light on it. But you've made it into a photograph. You've made it into something in an experience. And a lot of people would just pass over those kinds of things. So that's, I think as a photographer, that's one of the important things that we can do is find things that are maybe subtle. Um, and then here, again, just really pretty lines in here like kind of almost like water uh reflected water um and again yeah i knew this would be a uh, low uh, uh, this one i knew was a little bit darker because i could tell by your shadows that it got kind of dark in this one and i think you did a good job you brought your iso up a little bit because i i you probably realized that yeah it's a little dark i'm going to need to bring that iso up and you kept your shutter speed manageable there did you use a tripod for this or is this handheld that one was handheld. Okay, very good. And that's tough. At 1 15th is 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 a, is a tough shutter speed to handhold and get um good focus. And your focus is good. It doesn't look blurry really. I mean, you have good detail, so that's good. Um yeah, so all overall really good use of your camera manual settings. Um good what else I like to see and what I look for a lot of times, and especially in these first couple of assignments manual, is if you're changing the things. Now, I've said keep your aperture at 5.6, so I don't expect that to change. But things like, yeah, my ISO needed to go up to 450, or yeah, my, my shutter speed obviously needed to go to a 15th here and a 30th here, and sometimes it was a 320th. That's what I'm looking for to see if you're, you know, taking control of that camera and changing it. Because one of the things I do see a lot of times with new students that have never used a, a DSLR is they set it and then they think all lighting situations will be the same. And it's not like they're drastically different, even between two areas in a room, you know, and I'm sure you know that. But I think some people just kind of take for granted that exposure is exposure and a lot of that's because of our eyes. Our eyes are so good at adjusting to light that we just think cameras do that too, but they don't. Um, even in auto mode, they don't really do it as well as the human eye. So good job changing your settings and getting those exposures correct. So um, let's look at, uh, just uh, we'll just go with Jillian. Um, and then, like I said, we'll switch it up next week. Look at one more group here. Jillian, are you okay with sharing yours? I'm sure you are. I'm sure you are since you have a, a your photos on display at Sinclair. Um, let's see here. Jillian. Yeah. Let's check the chat just to make sure. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. 
So Jillian did hers. A lot of hers were more um, like some, most of them are more indoors, it looked like, and set up. Um, so not a lot of natural light, which is fine. Still good exposures. Um, so starting here, even this, the, that corner kind of bothers me a little bit. And again, I'm being very nitpicky about that. But like I can tell you kind of set up a backdrop and then you just kind of cut the corner of it. Either way, I, I know why you photograph this. It feels like because of the uh, the opposing colors, these are kind of like opposite colors on the color wheel. So you're showing the contrast between those two. Um, and my dog will say, here, Snippy, I'll let you in, buddy. Your dog will leave. Here, come on, come on, you can come in. Um, but uh, yeah, and then exposure wise, 200. And for you, same, same thing. I mean, th this is good. This works out. A 50th is a manageable shutter speed. Um, so all that works. All those camera settings are good. Five, six is a good place to start. And I know a lot of you, and I feel like Jillian has photo experience as well. So I appreciate you, you sticking with this five, six rule for right now, just to see what, you know, what it does when you just kind of switch the shutter speed. Um, but here, this exposure is really good. This is, I'm guessing on your, your, your dog's collar, but this fur looks really magnificent it almost doesn't look real it almost looks like a stuffed animal or something it's just really rich and i like the way this is sort of symmetrical and i feel like this is good composition as well it's symmetrical but the colors really pop out on that brown fur and it, and this right here i was looking at a fourth of a second now i have to ask you jillian were you using a tripod i'm, I'm sure it, you probably weren't if you had to get your dog to sit still like that but maybe you were because that's a tough shutter speed to uh hand hold so i was kind of curious yeah she says in chat here yeah she was using a tripod so yeah and with the fourth of a second you almost have to because that gets so long and the other thing with that is her dog is obviously very well um i won't say behave but sit still sat still for that which is pretty impressive because with the fourth of a second most dogs are going to be going everywhere you know and i it'd be hard to get that shot so if that is the case, let me just explain that. If you said, okay, if your dog moves around a lot, what you would have to do is you would have to bring your ISO up. You would have to bring this up to like 800, you know, and um, possibly because 800 would give you 400, 800 would give you two more stops, would at least give you fourth and eighth, 15th, which would still be a really slow shutter speed, but it would be a little more manageable. But I'm pretty impressed that you got that that sharp um, with that shutter speed. So, um, and then here we, we still have this long shutter speed, but it's working because you're, you're using the tools. You're using the correct tools um, for for this for this. So it works perfectly fine and good composition here. Top third, and this all works. This is kind of a leading line here coming in with this green. Nice little nice depth of field fall off, which you can get at five six. Um, you know, three five you can only get when your camera's at its widest angle. Um, I don't know if you have any questions about that. If you do, ask me. But there's a your your lenses actually do go to three five, but we're going to talk about that next week aperture. But they're limited to only at the widest angle that way. So as soon as you start to zoom in, all you get is five six, and that's why I say go for five six. Um, and then this one's really quite nice with this um, stained glass or um, it just looks like a almost like a little stained glass project thing you'd get for Christmas or something. I don't know. I remember I'd get some for my mom and I put them, bake them in the oven. I don't know if that's what this is, but I, I like the light either way. The light is really nice coming through this. It looks rounded a little bit. Again, good good composition. I like where you've cropped it off down here as far as, you know, bringing in this kind of soft in here. So I think that all works together. And here you've got a little more light because you've got light coming through this. So your light meter was exposing for the brightest area of the scene. That's what light meters do. They find the brightest area. So your exposure was for this. So it gets a little dark in here, but that's okay. Um, and it's a 125th, 125th. So that's a good, a good manageable shutter speed. This one's really nice. This was my, this one really kind of knocked, you know, kind of really got my attention um, just because of the focus is, is immaculate, really good focus on these highlights on the lips here. Um, and just the composition is, is, is really 
pretty perfect too, to be honest with you. I mean, for me anyway, the fingers coming in right here, just right, right left to left to right, right here to the lips and then up and then out and around. This leads your eye really well. It's really well composed, really well exposed. Um, emphasize color all day. I mean, this is really, this defines the assignment in that regard. Um, so yeah, great image. I'd I use I'd love to use that as a student example. It's a great it's a great shot. Um, and again, just that light hitting the lips right there is just a nice little touch. If that wasn't there, it would have felt a lot more flat. But that gives it just a little bit more three dimensional quality to it. So very good. Good skin tones too. Your white balance was on the money there. Like the the, the color is right. Um, yeah, and your white balance is auto, and, and auto works a lot of times is, is pretty good for white balance. It worked really well there, so great, great job there. And then here, just a nice soft close-up of a flower, again, with a really long, a long shutter speed, but they're working. You, you've got the right tools, like I've said, so um, good. And then that looks like the Super Mario version of the uh, Switch. I bought one for my kid. It might not be, but it looks like the uh, Nintendo Switch Super Mario version. I always like those uh, controllers on that and set up good soft depth of field. You know, it's just a kind of a simple quote unquote commercial shot, even though obviously it's not, but it's, it's just almost a product shot, but it's showing this red contrast against blue. So it's perfectly fine. Again, it's a, it's a, and it's a made photograph. She made this photograph. She set it up and photographed it. And then just a nice image of colored pencils. But again, I, I love the depth of field. I love the shallow depth of field. It just does something kind of magic around the edges and and, and kind of keeps your focus on the color here and on the, the pencil tips. And very good detail in this too. You can see all the little, you know, sharpening the little pieces of wood in there if you look at it up close. So that's very good. Yeah. And then this looks like uh, just a fireplace. Um, and really for how much low light that is it's captured pretty well fire can be tricky um but and it it's captured pretty well even up here you got a little bit here a little bit extra in your composition i think that kind of helps it out overall but half of a second shutter speed so it's a long shutter speed because you think that would put off a lot of light but it's kind of surprising how little light fire does put off so and this one, I feel like I, I would have I would have liked it a little more if it, the album was turned a little more towards me, like maybe pushed up in the back, uh, maybe a little bit more. But again, verticals are tough. Like anytime I see a vert, I struggle with verticals all the time. I still think this works well. I mean, I even started because I like the color and I like the focus and I like the um, the detail. And I also, you know, I, one second shutter speed. And, and, you know, still got this really tight, really good focus. So, and then this one, and, and almost a polar opposite in a way of this one, is sort of the flat looking straight down on the album. And, and again, good color there. You know, it's good contrast between yellow and black and great work overall. So that's what I'm looking for. I mean, and, and, and a lot of this, even though I know some of you have experience, a lot of these are, yeah, they're creative exercises, and I do want creativity, um, but it's the camera skills that I'm really looking at right now. And and what I wanted to talk about, and I know I already have, is this ISO, ISO versus long shutter speed thing. This, well, do I want to go to 800 ISO or 1600 ISO? Because the, the quality is going to fall apart. You know, it starts to get broken up, but don't be afraid to go to 800 ISO, especially on these modern cameras. You can do it and it still looks pretty, pretty good. It's not going to look as good as 200, but it's going to look pretty good. If you're doing like a really close up shot of something, yeah, it'll fall apart a little bit. But if you have a tripod and use it well, that's good. You're using the correct tools. The only time that's going to burn you is if you if your subject's moving. And that's what we're going to talk about today is creative motion. So if she had that long in those albums, when she was photographing those albums, if she had like a one second shutter speed and she had the album spinning and it was a one second shutter speed, everything would be blurry. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you know that, but that's what we're going to talk about today is creative motion and when and why it's an effective tool. Um, so first of all, 
as you all probably know, shutter speeds are broken down into fractions of a second, right? They're fractions of a second. And one of the things that drives me crazy about these entry-level DSLRs that most of us have um, is that they, they break them down not only into fractions of a second, but then they have thirds of stops in between. And what I mean by that is on these shutter speeds, on your, on your Canon Digital Rebels and your Nikons or D3500s, you'll have a 60th, but then you'll have an 80th, and then you'll have like a 100th. 80th and then a 100th or a one yeah it's a 100th okay now the problem with that it, it seems great right it just gives you more leeway to dial in that perfect exposure it seems like a good idea but it's really kind of to me kind of counterproductive and confusing and the reason is is because if if i say i want you to go a stop or not nobody's going to tell you this but if you go oh, i want to be a stop darker you're not going to be able to know exactly what a stop is between like a one two hundredth and a one 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 hundredth, even though you will because it's halves and doubles, but it just gets a little confusing. You're going to understand what I'm talking about next week when we do our depth of field project because we're going to nail that perfectly. And to do that, we want to have full, we want to have these prime shutter speeds. So one of the things I say is I, I've always said, you don't have to necessarily, unless if you're a photo major, which I know some of you are, yeah, these, th it's not even about memorization. After a while, you'll just know these. But if you're a photo major, or if you plan on getting into photography and continuing to do it, eventually you'll just know these anyway. I can write them down without thinking about it. And I'm sure some, you, some of you might be able to do that already too. But if you, if you have to memorize any of these right now, I would say memorize the shutter speeds. And the easiest way to memorize the shutter speeds is just start at a thousandth, right? Because every camera has a thousandth on it. A thousandth of a second is very fast. And if you start at a thousandth, it's all just half all the way down until you get to a 60th which is a little bit off because they want to keep the numbers whole. The only reason they do that is because a half of a 120 foot would be like 62.5, which then would just mess everything else up underneath it. So they go to a 60th there and I have a star by a 60th and then it goes to a 30th and then to a 15th. And then from there, because I didn't have enough room on this, I just kind of wrote them down here. It goes from a 30th to a 15th to an eighth then to a fourth. Then it goes to a half of a second then it goes to a whole second and it gets longer and longer after that. After a whole second, it'll go to two seconds, four seconds, eight seconds, 15 seconds generally is what it'll go to. 15 seconds, then 30 seconds. And then depending on your camera, it'll go to something called B, capital B. So if you're ever dialing your shutter speed left and going for a really long shutter speed, you're going to get to eventually this thing called capital B. And what that stands for is bulb, B-U-L-B, and which is an old term meant for this bulb flash that they used to use, which was kind of a longer burning, a longer burning flash. It wasn't like a quick flash. It was kind of a flash, but it was a longer burning flash. And they would put it on bulb setting to capture that whole burn of that bulb. So they just started calling it bulb. But what does it really mean? It just means constantly open. So basically on bulb setting, and I'm just explaining this just so you know, it is kind of a handy thing to do. The only times I found it useful is if I'm shooting like outer space, like nebulas or like, and I don't do that a lot. But if if if, if I want to keep my camera open continuously, that I would use it for like space shots and stuff like that. And also in dark rooms for another reason, which I'll talk about in a second. But on bulb setting... Just to let you know, if you've never heard of it before, or seen it or used it, it's just a matter of um, it's just a matter of you push the button down, okay, and it stays your your shutter speed will stay will stay your shutter will stay open as long as you keep your finger on that button, and I'm 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 dialing it to it now, so I have it on bulb setting. I'm just gonna push it. And you, you heard it click, hopefully, and it's still on there just because my finger's down. And then I let off and the shutter closes. So it's basically an indiscriminate amount of time. Um, the problem with that is it's hard to measure, right? It's kind of hard to measure unless you had a stopwatch or something like that. So you're, if it's 
you, your cameras a lot of times will have like even sometimes 10 minute shutter speeds depending on your camera um the other thing is a, a student asked me then i got her confused because i said you had to push your finger down and let your finger off anything other than bulb is not like that so meaning if i go to if i go to one second i have eight minutes i'm going to go up to back to one second um if i go to one second i don't have to keep my finger on it right i can just go and it clicked and it did a second, it did a one second shutter. So the only one that you have to keep your finger down on is bulb. Hopefully that makes sense. Does anybody have any questions about that? Let me let me explain a couple of other instances where bulb is cool. If you want to photograph lightning at night, bulb is awesome. Okay. Because what you can do is if it's dark at night and you're over a cornfield and there's no light pollution, say you're over a dark cornfield out in the country. You can put your camera on a tripod if it's thunderstorming and if you're brave enough to go out there, maybe it's farther away. That's the best time when it's not raining on you. But you can set your camera up on a tripod and just keep your shutter open until lightning strikes. And as soon as lightning strikes, let your hand off of the shutter. OK, and the thing about that is. It didn't really capture any light as long as you didn't have a lot of light pollution. It didn't capture any light that whole time while you were waiting for the lightning. But as soon as that lightning strikes, boom, it's got that exposes the sensor and then you close the shutter and there you go. You've got a photo of lightning. That's how people get really good photos of lightning. They use the bulb setting. The other other thing that I used to do a lot is I would do creative things with people. So I would get a dark, in a dark room, a small room like this, and I would turn off all the lights and seal the windows. It'd be at night. And I would set my camera up or have my camera in my hand a lot of times. A lot of times I would just set my camera up on a tripod. Okay. And I'd, I, back, back then we had something called a cable release where I could hold onto it like this and keep it open without keeping my finger on it. And what I would do is I would take a flash like this and then go around while my camera was on bulb setting and um uh, flash them right so it's not it's not it's not working yet come on where are we going here it's not uh it's not fire i would flash them with this i would just like that okay so what would happen is my camera would be open the whole time my shutter would be open the whole time i'm in a dark room then i would have them move and then i would flash them again and then have them move one more time and just maybe sometimes just a little bit, not even a lot. So at the end of it, I would have like triple or quadruple exposures on my film. OK, just from dark room flashing with flashing them with a bulb setting. And um, it works pretty well. It's kind of a cool process. So uh, that's another reason you might want to use bulb. OK, so that's that's a fun thing to do. Um, but today, what we're talking about is um, motion. We want to show motion, which is a little different than the flash thing I was just talking about, because you're still kind of stopping them with the flash. You got to think about that. If you're in a dark room and that flash hits, it's only going to show exposure for that second that that flash hits. Not even a second, like millisecond that the flash hits. Uh, but what we're trying to do with creative motion is show motion. And Anne's already done this quite a bit. So this won't be a problem for Anne, I don't think. I don't think it'll be a problem for anybody, really. But um, we're going to have to use long shutter speeds now to create motion, to show motion in our photos. And what I want you to write down or what you, I want you to think about is how I have this 60th. I have this 60th of a second start here, okay, right there. Because um, that's generally in in circles, photo circles, that's the deadline for being able to handhold your camera without getting blur. Even though, honestly, I've seen people that are good that can handhold it a 30th or handhold it a 15th. You can do it, but it gets tricky. A 60th is generally considered the safe zone for handholding without a tripod and being able to get a photo without blur. OK, that's about as slow as you can go. So with this project, we want to be all on this side of a 60th, right? Even a 60th, if you want to try a 60th, you can. Um, but I want you for this project to be shooting everything at a 60th or longer, preferably all of them longer. So I'm talking a 30th, a 15th, an 8th, a 
okay, an eighth, a fourth, a half, a one second. If you want to try some 30 seconds, whatever you want to do, this is going to be a very experimental thing. But there's a catch to this, right? And this is where photography, the balance of the exposure triangle comes into play. And this is why it's important, is that if you are going to let in this much light, say you're at a 15th or say you're at an 8th or a 4th, and say you're outside and it's the middle of the day and you're going to try to shoot a photo of someone moving or a car moving or someone riding a bike past you, um, and you want you want to show motion and you have your shutter speed set at a fourth, okay? And it's bright and sunny outside. What's that going to look at look like if you have your aperture at five six? Anybody have an idea? I'll just tell you, it's going to be overexposed, really bad, because an eighth of a second outside in really bright light is going to overexpose your sensor. So what that means is if you're going to have a really slow, well, wrong one. if you're going to have a really slow shutter speed, say, we'll just keep it, we'll just say a 15th for right now. You can't be at five, six anymore outside. You can't, it, it'll just be too bright. Even if you're at ISO 100 or 200, it's still going to be too bright. It'll overexpose. You're going to have to, Take your aperture now and adjust it this way and go to 16 or 11 or 22. Because what's that going to do? It's going to counterbalance this long shutter speed. It's going to it's going to tamp down and it's going to start to stifle some of that light that's being let in by your 15th of a second shutter speed. So you have to remember that when you do this creative motion project, that you're going to have to, you're going to definitely have to make your shutter or your aperture smaller. OK, and when I say smaller, that means a bigger number, which is a little confusing. But five, six is a bigger aperture. You go to 16, bigger number, smaller aperture, which we're going to talk about next week quite a bit. And you're going to understand it more. But for this project, and I can't tell you what lighting conditions you're going to be in, but I definitely would say you're going to at least be at F11 or F16. I would, you know, F56 is going to be too much light. All right. And as far as ISO goes, you can keep it at 200 if you want. If you go indoors, make it 800. Make it 800 if you go indoors, just like you would normally. Don't don't think much about your ISO. Again, ISO is just general reading of light. First thing you think of, okay, is it dark in here? What is this? This is indoors. This should be ISO 400 or 800. That's what I'd be in here right now. That's it. And then just set it. And then if you go outside later and do some outside, set your ISO to 200. Don't be afraid to change your ISO. Just don't use it as an exposure tool necessarily. Don't say, oh, it's too dark. I need to just make my ISO higher. First, try to fix it with your shutter speed and your aperture until you run into a, where you can't anymore. Hopefully that makes sense. The ISO is, is sort of the first thing you do and you, you, you don't want to mess with it afterwards. So let me get my notes here. And just kind of go over what I how I talk about this. But again, this is not a huge long lecture tonight or anything. Um, so shutter speeds are in fractions of a second. Always like if you want to think about, it, like I said, start at a thousandth. You got a one thousandth, then you can go the other way. One thousandth, then there's a two thousandth, then there's a four thousandth. Some cameras have an eight thousandth on them. Why would we need that fast of a shutter speed, like an eight thousandth of a second? The reason is for stuff like machinery or like if you see those close up photos of like water droplets hitting the water and they're, you know, you actually see the you actually see the moment the droplet hits the water. It's kind of cliche. You see it a lot now, but it's kind of cool. I mean, when they started doing that, it's, it's because of how fast that shutter speed is. It's stopping everything in its tracks. I mean, it, it's. If you think about it, how amazing that was for science when they first, when that first started happening, when you could have that fast of a shutter speed, how well, how much that did for science, because you could basically look at a horse galloping um, and there, Moybridge did this, right? Edward Moybridge. Um, you could see how a horse gallops and exactly what their gait is every step. You could see things like gears in a machine and if something's going wrong or whatever, you can see exactly the process because you could stop everything. It's a big deal. 
Um, but that's why you want a fast shutter speed. Or if you wanted to photograph a hummingbird in flight and stop its wings completely, you'd have to have a really fast shutter speed to do that. So on the other end of that, the slow shutter speed, why would we ever want to do that? Well, because sometimes we want to show motion. Some, and it's just an optical illusion, kind of, in a way. It's it's a trick. But we, we want to blur things to kind of show show motion, right? Like, um, you know, just off the top of my head, uh, Ralph Eugene Meat Yard used to do it all the time. And um, I don't want to, uh, I, I don't really, I'm going to, I'm going to Google his name really quickly and just see if I find one right off the bat. Um, if I don't want, I don't, but he's, he's a good example of using slow shutter speeds in some of his work. Um, not all of his work, but he did it a lot. Um, so let's see. Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, here we go. Here's one. So, and I'm going to share screen here. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, got Meat Yard here. And then it's going to say screen sharing is not available until I move it over there. Okay, so Meat Yard was kind of a weird guy. He actually just lived in Kentucky and he was like a, I think a postal worker or something. He was kind of a normal go to work every day kind of guy. But he did this, uh, he, he, he'd just find these kids that live around him, you know, and he had kids too. He wasn't like a weirdo or anything. He was his neighbors and stuff. And um, he would photograph these kids and, you know, and just there'd be out playing. But a lot of times he'd do these long exposures of them. And, and you know, a lot of times he'd have them, <laughs> he'd have them put on masks and sit, you know, like it looks like a Richard Nixon mask or something, but he just have them put on mask and like, that's not a kid, that's an adult, but he would just get his neighbors to do this stuff. And he, he really kind of became a pretty well-known fine art photographer, but even like that, that's long shutter speed. Um, so he used it, um, you know, he'd have kids like uh, there's one I remember he had like here or he, he did it, you know, so he used it a lot of times for creative expression and he'd have kids. He had one. I remember a kid jumping out of a window and the kids blurry. Yeah, here it is. Yeah. So here he has like, oops, sorry. He has this kid jumping out of a window here. Now it'll go to something else. Yeah, there it is. But, uh, and it's, it's, you know, whatever you could say, it's kind of Christ-like or whatever. I don't know. I don't try to dig too deep. I just get my own vibe from it, but it, it has this with that long shutter speed, it gives it some kind of, uh, um, you know, a different vibe, almost, you could say, for lack of a better word, kind of a disturbing, kind of an uneasy feeling. So anyway, that's, sometimes that's how long shutter speed is used. And in my opinion, that's kind of a good way to use it, you know, blur a face or add a little bit of a mystery to something, maybe make something a little bit uh, kind of confusing. Um, but it also shows motion. It also shows something moving. And I'm going to show a lot of that in my student examples. So here's my rule of thumb on this that I think that will get you started is make sure your ISO is, or make sure your ISO is where it should be 200 to 400 to 800, depending outdoors, 200, indoors, 800. Don't, don't worry about your ISO. Just do normal what you would with your ISO. Your aperture is going to have to go smaller because you're going to let in a lot of light with that long shutter speed. So make your aperture 8, f8, f11, f16, f22 even, okay? And then your shutter speed, don't be afraid to go really long with it. But also don't be afraid to even go kind of short with it, but not too short. Don't go shorter than the 60th. Stay kind of in the 30th to a 15th range. But the real golden range, I think, is around an eighth or a fourth. An eighth or a fourth of a second will give you some pretty cool stuff, all right? So the next thing you have to do now is have things moving. There's two ways to go about that. You can move, right? You can move and actually make some interesting things by moving. You can move your camera and do some cool stuff. Or you can put your camera on a tripod and open it up for a four second and have your son or your brother or whoever, family member, friend, run across this frame or do what Meat Yard does and, you know, jump off of a porch or something, you know, it doesn't have to be like his stuff, but have somebody jump off of a, you know, something low and, or do something active or run across the garage or whatever. And you're going to see that, but that makes for some pretty cool stuff, especially if it's, you know, 
abandoned buildings in the background. You can really get, you can do some cool stuff with it, um, depending on your background and everything else. So, but you don't have to be creepy just because I like creepy. I like other stuff. It doesn't have to be creepy. Um, but, you know, sometimes that does have an effect. So next, let me go through these. So that's what we're going to do is show motion. So shutter speeds affect the way moving objects are shown, right? If they're, if it's a really fast sh so shutter speed, it's going to stop it dead in its tracks. You're, it's going to instant in time, forever stopped. If it's a long shutter speed, it's going to show blur. And it's going to show motion. So a faster moving object needs a faster shutter speed, obviously. Um, but freezing an object in motion isn't always the best idea to show motion. And that's my point. And what I said to the first class was, imagine if like you were in New York City and you had like all these pigeons, you know, around a statue and you kind of run up on them and to get them to fly away. And then you want to take a picture of them flying off. If you did that with a really fast shutter speed and all just captured them in air, that could be cool. It could look good. But I think with a little bit of a slower shutter speed and have a little bit of blur in the wings and kind of a dark kind of black and white look and maybe some of the pigeons are blurred, you know, at like a 15th of a second, that to, to me has more of a kind of a cool effect, kind of a more, uh, I don't know, esoteric effect. And, and, and a lot of that's up to the taste of the photographer. But I want you I want to assure you, too, that I'm not living in the 80s or anything like that. Like I do keep track of modern photography and what's kind of cool right now and what's good. And shutter speed and long shutter speed is still a very viable, useful tool. It's not something people used to do in the past and they don't do it as much anymore. It's still a very useful way to show motion. I see it a lot with fine art photographers. It's done differently maybe now, but it's still, you know, the subject matters have changed a little bit over the years, but it's still, uh, it's still a very viable technique. So um, yeah. And then sometimes we want longer shutter speeds to show motion. So like I already said, using a tripod is one way to do it, especially if you have a moving subject. If your subject's moving, yeah, use a tripod and just because what that'll do, hopefully some of you know this, but it, let's say I have my camera on a tripod and I'm photographing this room back here, right? For whatever reason. If I have like a 30 second shutter speed even, and I just hold it open for 30 seconds, it's going to look, this room is going to look exactly the same as it would if I did it for a 500th of a second shutter speed. Why? Because nothing's moving in it. So it doesn't really matter, right? But if I at the, if I did it, my cat's down the hallway right there. If I did it, my camera on a tripod and had a 30 second shutter speed and my cat's down the hallway, that will be a little ghostly figure in my photo, you know, and that that's kind of what we're looking for. So you got to remember, if you have your camera on a tripod and nothing's moving in your image, it'll still look stationary, even with the long shutter speed. So I'm sure that makes sense to most of you. So the idea is we want that blur. We're looking for that blur a little bit. Um, so um, there's, a, there's a few tricks I wanna kind of just explain for you to try if you wanna experiment with it. And the first one is panning. And panning is kind of difficult. Panning just means following your subject as it moves, right? So in video, it's the same thing. It's you pan, but you just grab the video head and you're just panning the shot. But in photography, it's a little bit different. In still photography, in still photography, what you're doing is you're panning something that's moving and you're trying to keep the camera sort of attached to it. And it's kind of hard. It's like playing a video game almost. You got to kind of time it right. But if you time it right, the thing moving looks stationary. It's still in focus. But the background, because you're moving your camera while the shutter speed's open, blurs. And that's, we've all seen this. Um, you'll see like, a, and I have an example of it that we're going to see in a minute. Um, it makes the person, whoever's driving the car or the bike or running or whatever it is, it makes it look like they're moving faster or at least moving. It's an optical illusion, but they, it, they still do it a lot. That's one thing you can try. The one thing about panning I want you to keep in mind is that when you're panning, you want whatever you're panning to be pretty dang close to you. If you can't get it by physically being close to you, then the only other way is to have a really zoomy lens. Because 
if I was like, say, to try to pan my cat, even though my cat's not running right now, or a squirrel or something far away, the farther away something is when it's moving, the less exaggerated the motion is in the image. And that's just simple physics, right? If I put my hand really far away and move it around, it's not as exaggerated the movement. But if I put my hand right here, it's really exaggerated. So what I mean by that is I've seen students will be like, oh, I was trying to pan this squirrel running in my backyard and it was like 30 or 40 feet away and it's too small, right? It's just a little dot in the frame and you're not really gonna be able to pan that. So you kind of need, if you're gonna pan a car and obviously don't stand out in the middle of the road, but you need to stand maybe on the sidewalk by the road and wait for a car to come by and hopefully they don't think you're weird by photographing them, but you would just, pan the car as it drives by and it would be kind of close to you within like you know 10 feet or something like that and it's a pretty big object that's how you would get a good pan of like a car or somebody on a bike or something so it has to be relatively big the way they do it in races is they just have those really zoomy lenses so like indy 500 or something like that they're really like zooming in with their lens and then panning it so i'll show you an example of that but it's tricky but if you want to try panning I would say a good, like a fourth of a second or lo even longer, a fourth of a second is pretty good for panning. Um, but, you know, experiment with it. Experiment with those shutter speeds down there below a 60. Don't be afraid to switch them up a lot. Okay. So the second one that's kind of a cool little trick that actually one of my students reminded me of, I had forgotten about it. And it's kind of fun to do is, um, where'd my camera go? I just had it in my hand. I set it over here is zooming in and zooming out while you have your shutter open. So say you have like a one second shutter speed, like I'm just gonna switch mine to one second here. You gotta get your exposure right first too. You gotta remember that. Like you gotta get your exposures right still. But what you can do with the, what you can do with this is, and you all have zoom lenses, which all that means is they get wider, they get wider and more zoomed in. So you can, you can literally take a photo and I'm gonna go ahead and snap it. And then I just zoomed in while the shutter was open, right? So what does that do? It just kind of creates these weird lines in the image. And, and it, you know, you could say it's kind of gimmicky, but it's kind of fun to try. So that's something to try. So basically all that is is taking the shot. You can do it from either way. You can go from you can go wide to tight or tight to wide. It doesn't matter. That's another little trick to do. Um, but basically the idea is. There's the word creative in it too. So try to be creative, you know, get something creative. And what I mean by that, and I don't think I'm going to have this issue with any of you, but um, don't just, you know, roll a coin down the step, or I don't know. I'm just, uh, this is off the top of my head, roll a coin on the countertop and take a photo of it. Try to, maybe that could be interesting, but at least frame it and, and, and get into it and, and try to set it up in a way that it's it, it feels like it's a good photograph. Meaning don't just say I'm just practicing my shutter speech. Try to make something interesting out of it too. That's 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 kind of the point of that. But um, all right. So does anybody have any questions about that? Um, yeah, I don't think anybody's really going to have issues with this, but and it, it should be fun. You should have a little bit of fun with this. Just remember small aperture. Don't keep your aperture at five, six or everything's going to be, everything's going to be like this. If you have, if you have it five, six, when you hit play, when you hit play on your um, camera, it's all going to look like that. If you're at five, six, just like th that's just what I took in here, right? That's just because I I'm letting in too much light. So you have to tamp down your light with your aperture. Okay. So that's that that's the only that can be a problem and be hard a, a problem that you have to solve. All right. So let's look at uh student examples and then we'll be done for the week here. Um and share screen and go back to Flickr, get out of meat yard here. Um let's see here, bookmarks. Um all right, and we'll go to uh me. And I'm not going to over talk all these, but a couple of them will um, I'll kind of explain and, and we'll look at the numbers on these as well. And here's what I was. So this is just a dark room. Right. And, and, and this is perfectly fine. And another thing I want to tell you what, by looking at this, if you do like this and you want to paint with light, all this is is a dark room. Everything's off. It's at night. And then they use a the little light source. I don't know what that is, to be honest with you. But uh, 
and they just keep the shutter open as they move the light. If you like this, please do this. Just don't do 30 of them like this. Like do a few like this and then move on to something else. I'd like to see variation, like maybe some during the day, and some in a room, maybe some playing with a flash if you have one or a flashlight. You could use a flashlight and turn it on and off really quick too. You, there's a lot you can do with this. Okay, but yeah, that's just, uh, you know, I, is it the most creative thing I've ever seen? No, but I even like these little streaks of light here, you know, and it works. It works well. It, it, this is kind of an experimental process. And this is the one I was talking about where it was uh, someone running across the garage door, but this one's actually at a fourth of a second. So a fourth of a second is a really pretty good long shutter speed because you're going to capture a lot of blur. Um, and she's really close to her. And this is something I want you to notice. She's really close to her when she photographs her here. She And when I say really close, I'm saying she's probably about 10 feet away. All right. She's pretty close. And it's ISO 100 and F22. So that's what I was saying. You have to, you, that aperture has got to be small because it's just going to get overexposed really quickly with that long shutter speed. So you really have to keep that ISO kind of low especially outdoors in the day, this has to be low. If you go indoors, you can bring this up a little bit if you want. But here's one where she's kind of close. And then I'm going to go back to this one. But here's one where she got a little bit farther away and at a different angle, but she's actually using the same shutter speed. And it's that's why it's kind of curious as to how is this one not nearly as blurry as this one? And it almost looks like she might have zoomed on this one a little bit. Like she might have taken her zoom and tried to zoom at the same time. I don't know. But to me, what it is is more so she's a little bit farther away and kind of at a different angle. So she's not really running directly across from her as she was in that first one. That's kind of the impression I get. Um, but same same settings exactly. And then on this one, this was before I was telling people, hey, stay below a 60th. I, I just said a 60th is where you should, but I didn't really hone that in on them. So she kind of went to a 200th. But the reason I keep this in here is because even at a 200th, you can still see motion. Like you see her fingertips in this, they're still blurry. So it's just a good example of even at 200th of a second, you still see motion. And you still see even in the, in the snow um, a little bit, if you get real close up to it, you can see it blurred a little bit too. So that's just kind of, to me, an interesting way to like understand it, even at a 200th. I think at about 500, and I know at a thousand, but at that point, it's real tough to get blur. But a 200, the 125th, you'll still see it. You'll still see it sometimes. Um, so then we have another painting with light. And again, I, I'm okay with all these. I like this one because there's a, a human hand in it as well. It almost looks like the way AI paints hands with like six fingers here, but it's all just photographic. Um, but yeah, it's like the ball of the hand and the bone of the arm. It's, it just kind of gets kind of eerie and kind of strange. But again, and this is this is a really long exposure at 30 seconds, 30 second exposure. So you have a lot of leeway down there, like from from a 60th all the way to 30 seconds. There's a lot of shutter speeds to choose from. All right. So just play around with it. Um, and then here we have. This one's kind of, um, you know, this was one of these, I almost feel like this is just a practice in shutter speed, you know, and it was kind of dark in here in this, these gyms in these indoor situations, they're a lot darker than you think they are. And the high, so the ISO was kind of high and the aperture was kind of big. So, and it was already letting in a lot of light. And then the shutter speed's not really that long at 120th. That's still kind of long, but I think what she was trying to do is pan this guy a little bit but I don't think her shutter speed was long enough and he probably was not running um, either fast enough or you know, in the right direction, maybe towards him or, or towards the side as much as this way. But either way, I think she was trying to pan. Still, it's fine. It's a shutter speed experimental shot and it works. Um, but then we get into these. Now, how are these done? This is just basically, a lot of this was done around, I think these were done around, uh, late fall maybe or when christmas lights were still or were 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 going up a little bit so people were but you can do this even in without christmas lights basically all you're doing is you're looking at street lights you go out at night anytime at night and you, you just get a long shutter speed again and then you can take your camera and not only not only do things like 
not only do things like this, but if you're hand holding with the long shutter speed, you can do things like, you know, like this or like this or like this. The more you do it, the more exaggerated it's going to get. Sometimes it seems like it's almost better if you just lightly do it just a little bit and just get those lines just kind of just moving a little bit. But don't be afraid to do this with your camera either, because you're kind of that's what you're going for is that streaky weirdness. So, yeah, just be just experiment with things like that. And I'll show you another really good example of that. All right. So that one and then this one is another one I should explain. And it's probably some of you understand how this went on. But this is a three second shutter speed, three seconds. ISO 100 F22, which is where that's good. Three second shutter speed. She told her sister, she said, look to the left, look at me and look to the right. And then in that three seconds, she captured that. And then the light is kind of weird. And I thought at first she might've edited that in, but I think what she did is she had a green light kind of shining from the side and she had a kind of a magenta light shining from the front. Um, but it works, it works. And that's, it, it's just, you know, it's kind of eerie. I almost wish in this one, this is the fine art photographer in me a little bit. I almost wish she would have taken off, like not put the sweatshirt on, had some weird like, you know, wedding gown or I don't know, like something kind of more like a character in a movie or something, you know, a sweatshirt just feels sort of normal to me, but it, it either way, it's still good. But I like if you set something up, you can also think about what your subjects are wearing and you know, what, what kind of situation they're in. Are they in like an old dilapidated house or wherever, you know? So you can think about those things too. I get that it's experimental. And at first you might just be trying to get the right exposure, but, you know, think about those things as well too sometimes. Um, and then here's my first panning shot. It's not mine, but the first one I got, and it's good, except the shutter speed's too fast. Okay, it's a 60th of a second. So why do I say it's too fast? Because it's it almost shows too much of the background. It's too in focus still. So it still shows motion. It does. But it could have been swooshier back here with a longer shutter speed. And here's the best pan. I'm going to skip ahead and I'll go back. But the best pan I, I got was um, uh, la, la, this one, right? So this one's a little long. I, I don't have the, the details. This one was, I think, a fourth of a second. And it's still not totally swooshy, but it's swooshier. It's more, I, I wish there was a better word for that, but more blurry back there and really good focus on the bike rider here. This is a really good panning shot, very good focus on the bike rider. And here it really looks like motion. And that's the purpose of panning. If you don't want to do that, you don't have to do it. I'm just saying that's, that's kind of how it's done. That's almost textbook panning right there. So let's go back really quickly. Um, and then, yeah, there, there's quite a few good examples here. Uh, this is the one I was talking about where they were, where, where you were just moving your camera ever so slightly left to right, kind of a bit, but up and down, just bobbling it up and down ever so slightly. And I think that's out there at Clifton Gorge where they have the Christmas lights every year. So um, and then here, this is in Kettering at that Danbury Dollar Saver, I think it used to be, but it's on Stroop or Wilming, it's Stroop, I think. But here is just someone on the side of the road on the sidewalk with a tripod letting cars drive by, right? With a 30 second shutter speed, extremely long. And honestly, I think this the aperture should have been smaller because it feels too bright. And you might disagree with me on that, but it's a nighttime shot, but that that's letting in so much light with 30 seconds that it almost makes it look like daytime with all the, there's a lot of light pollution when you get into Kettering or into these towns. So, and you know, maybe that's fine. Maybe that's what they wanted. So, uh, and then here, this is less light pollution. So another 30 second shutter speed, but F16. So now the uh, aperture is a lot smaller, but this is just somebody standing over like an overpass on an overpass over a highway or a road and capturing headlights coming this way and brake lights going that way. That's all it is, um, you know, and it's straight. They just, for this, I think they just kept their camera on a tripod, which in its own right is kind of cool because then you see how straight these cars move in a line or whatever, you know, there's something about that too. But so either way, and then here is just a spin toy. 
Um, what what is the uh, one fourth of a second? Again, a fourth of a second will get you a lot of blur. Um, and then here is somebody's phone, I think, or maybe alarm clock, but I think it's their phone. And they just photographed 10, that's a 10 second shutter speed. Uh, that's the thing that's kind of hard sometimes is that one tenth or 10 and the way the, the cameras show up, I'm guessing that's 10. But when I look at this image, I think, man, that's a long time, 10 seconds to hold that phone like that. But it's quite possible that's 10. Okay. Um, I should know, like, but it's hard. It, the thing is, you'll see when they, when they, when the flicker writes down or shows the shutter speed, it's hard to see if it's, they show a whole number when it gets into the seconds, but then they do that as well for a half second and a fourth second sometimes, but I'm pretty sure it's 10 seconds. Um, and then here we just have a dog catching a ball. And honestly, an 80th of a second is too fast. It still works. So an 80th of a second does show motion and you see it's canine teeth kind of, kind of popping up out of the jaw almost just because of the motion. Um, but yeah, it works. Um, I'm going to get some good examples from these next, from you all too. I'll, I'll update this a little bit. And this, this works too. It's creative. It's creative motion. This is borderline. It, it's okay. I'm not going to, I'm not going to attack it. I, I just, for me, I, I wish it was a little bit longer of a shutter speed and I don't know. I almost wish it was black and white too. Maybe I just, when I see black, people's backyards and stuff like it sort of throws me off because it takes a little bit of the mystery away from the image if that makes sense maybe it does maybe it doesn't but when I see like you know a jacuzzi or whatever and stairs and a fence it sort of throws me off a little bit I'd rather see woods or something like that um, but maybe that's just me um, and then here this guy he did um, contact lenses like those call it those white contact lenses and this was from a final project but I threw it in creative motion because he just did it the whole time. And it's sort of this transition from a regular person to a zombie. That was his final project. And uh, so he just did this with one second exposures, had kind of a big aperture. So it was really, it had to have been pretty dark. And uh, that's what you get. So again, you can use people's faces. It's, it's fun to take photos of people when they're moving. You can get these kind of weird effects. And this one's my favorite one. Um, mainly because uh, it's just so mysterious and kind of haunting. And hopefully you can see this on your screens as well as I can. But it's just, I think uh, it was uh, a, a younger sister or something like that. And it's just, uh, she's got like a kind of a nightgown, almost looks like a hospital gown. It, it's just kind of, I don't know, interesting to me. And then you see her neck here and then this light and then all of a sudden there's no face like there's you don't see anything up here. And I think that's because the object that was putting out the light was solid here. And I'm not exactly sure. I didn't pick their brain on this one, but somehow they blocked out the face here with this. So you get this really kind of ghostly. It's just a ghostly kind of haunting image. And I really like and even this line over here, just everything about that. I, I really enjoy that image um, for what it is. And partially it might have been accidental but it still, it still worked out pretty well. So, and then um, in this one, again, this is a really pretty fast shutter speed at a 160th, but the album was moving. She was playing it and you see it right here in the lines here. So she did capture motion. Um, and I like the, I like the way this is framed and composed too. She did a good job with that. And here's the one I was talking about, the example of zooming in and zooming out when you have a long shutter speed, that's what you're going to get. Now, do you have to put something right in the middle? No, you don't have to. Um, but if you experiment with that, you'll get this sort of like, I don't know, it almost reminds me of like Star Wars or something with the spaceships flying through the stars. But it, it does cool things with the way it breaks up the background. So yeah, it can be fun. And then that's the panning shot. So hopefully that's enough for you to get an idea of what we're looking for. I mean, if you want to get a little even more in depth with making your photographs and Kelly Jocelyn will tell you this all the time. And, and I'm more of a camera skills class kind of guy for this class, but at the same time, if you're a fine art photo student. And even if you're in VizCom and you want to really go that extra mile, like create a scene, create something, you know, create a scene and then use, and then use your, long shutter speed and it'll it'll go a long way if you do 
Um, but either way, you can also do stuff like just lights and all that kind of stuff. But hopefully you just have fun with it and enjoy it. But that's it. And it's going to be 30 and 10, just like the rest. Next week's assignment's only going to be four, which I'll talk about. But creative motion is 30 and 10. And I want to ask this. Is anybody getting confused on when things are due or is everybody keeping up pretty well on that? Is everybody doing okay on that? Um, if you do, email me. I have on course weekly sessions in our e-learn um I, I i think i need to update yours this class as i have the first class updated but i'm going to update yours and it should be up to date and tell you when things are due it's always a friday after i assign it so just so you know but if you ever are kind of lost on that just email me and i'll i'll tell you um and then also it'll be in weekly sessions and i'll i'll, I'll uh if you go into it's under content and then weekly sessions and then you'll see the chart and right now ours is behind i need to update it but i will tonight so um i think that's it uh i'm i think i've covered everything i need to talk about yeah long shutter speed and uh iso and yeah does anybody have any questions or concerns about anything um y'all are doing a great job uh so far i mean i've really enjoyed seeing what you've had so far so hopefully just keep it up everybody's doing great um, looking forward to seeing what you do next. So that's it. Thank you all for being here. Um, yeah, one other thing, if you want to meet on Thursdays, let me know. I generally, my online classes, I've just done Thursdays a work day. And I think with online, it works okay because it just get it's lab time. That's what it would have been anyway. But if lab time and digital photography is go shoot and work on your computer, so, but if you do need me on Thursdays or you want to do critiques or you have any suggestions, I'm available for that. So I'm not just making Thursday unavailable because I don't want to do anything. So I just want you to know that if you need that time or want that time, just tell me. Um, but other than that, I think we're done. So um, I'll stop recording.